Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Here's the Deal. My name is Jennifer Simpson. We are joined today. Uh, we're really lucky we have the perspective of someone who is um, outside the HD community, but we are really talking about the power of shared experience. So we have a uh, documentarian, Kristen Johnston, with us today. She made a movie called Dick Johnson is Dead, um, which might sound a little, bit, a little bit scary, and that is the lovely Dick Johnson. Um, for anyone who has watched the film, I think you've probably fallen in love with him a little bit as I think we all have. Um, and the film really looks at, uh, at Kirsten's dad and his journey and their journey together through, uh, through a dementia diagnosis and through some symptoms of dementia, but also it's really an ode to, to your dad. And it's really, it is beautiful. It's quirky and it's funny and it's lovely. Um, we are so glad to have you with us today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. And Glad to have my dad here in a, with us in spirit and image. Yes. Um, and we also have the wonderful Marianne Emmerich. Uh, for folks who have seen the series before, you might recognize Marianne. Um, Marianne was actually on the first episode of Here's the Deal we ever did um, about sort of post-event blues that you get once you, when you get to sort of are enveloped by the community and then you have to go home and feel like it again. Um, so what we're talking about a little bit today is the importance of shared experience. Um, so something that was really powerful for me when I watched the film was the ways in which some of the experiences you had with your dad, as well as with your with your mother who uh, suffered from Alzheimer's, were so echoed in so many ways, the experiences of HD families. Um, one of the things that struck me hugely was uh, in thinking about your, your dad's experience, the power of of taking some control before things get a little bit worse. I know we've talked about the concept of time and the importance of time um, and the fact that you took the time and effort to capture your dad at that moment in his life. Um, what was sort of for you, what was sort of the impetus for doing that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Jennifer and I just met the other day and I have to say I was so, there were so many um, moments when you said um, sort of words and phrases that come from your community that I was like, ooh, that's a good one. And I have to say like post-event blues, that's a really good one. Uh, <laughs> and also like, I like the title of this conversation, like here's the deal. Like, can we get down to what's really happening here? Um, so, so, you know, to set the stage for people who haven't seen the film, um, you know, I tried to make a comedy about dementia and death in which like my father dies over and over again, but comes back to life. And there uh, is a moment in the film where uh, we go to his funeral and he is, he is, you know, sort of in the wings listening, um, but it's with his real family and friends in the church that he attended for decades. And it was an idea that came to me of like, oh, you know, based on my mother's funeral, just been like this sort of nightmare of like, we did this amazing funeral, people said amazing things, and then she wasn't there to be happy about it at the end. And like, I couldn't hug her at the end. And so this notion of like, oh, well, what about we just do it while my dad's alive? Um, and yet I did have like the most insane post-event blues <laughs> after that funeral because, you know, it took months and months to prepare. I had many conversations with all the people involved, including the pastor of the church and my brother who was resistant to doing it and my father's best friend of like, can we really do this? And we did it and we pulled it off. And then two days later, I woke up and I was like, oh, I was so sad. And I was like, what's wrong with me? Like, you know, we had a five camera shoot and 200 people were there and it was like, went off without a hitch and my father loved it. And I was like, I realized, I thought doing that funeral as for real as I could, if we did it, then my dad would never have to die. We'd never have to do his real funeral. Mm. And, and, you know, that's what I think is so in common between our communities, like Marianne, like this thing of anticipatory grief and how sort of we're like toggling between like, in this moment, I have already lost partially this person who I love. They're like here in fragments, but like, it's gonna get worse. So I can't grieve this moment, 
but sometimes it just thwacks you out of the blue and you're just, you know, there's a moment in my film where my father says, I'm your little brother now. And I was just <laughs> like, I never imagined my father could say that to me. And so, you know, I mean, I, I think the idea for me in making this film came out of having experienced my mother's dementia. And I think that's another thing in common with our communities is that there's generational loss. Um, there's the possibility, like even if you're imagining, am I going to have a child? Might that child have this disease? Um, so there's all of this uh, imagined loss that sometimes comes to be and sometimes does not come to be. So, um, Having lived through my mother's dementia, one, I knew I just did not have the capacity to only deal with it with pain and grief. I just couldn't do it again. I didn't like, I was like, I've cried a lot. <laughs> and I can't cry anymore. And then the other thing is I've worked as a documentary cinematographer for the last 30 years and I've traveled all around the world. And you know, I'm very interested in social justice and I've filmed a lot of um, post-conflict zones and literally like five post-genocide zones. Um, and what I've learned from a lot of people who are survivors is a lot of people are hilarious. And you're like, how's that possible? Your entire <laughs> family was killed in a genocide and you're hilarious. Yeah, the power of, of laughter <laughs> and the... As a, as a coping mechanism, as a coping tool is massive. You know, I, I'm thinking also, you know, Marianne to talk about your experiences with your, so with your mother, um, how, how your family uses, has used humor in your HD journey as well. We were just talking about this the other day. I said, if you ever need a comedian, um, my entire family, um, we, yeah. we all decided to become comedians. Um, forget about what they go to school for or what they're, um, their trade is, but they all, everybody decided to become comedians. Um, but for a long time, my family, you know, kept it not like a secret, but just to protect one another, um, from just that pain that we were all feeling, but we just didn't talk about it. And it was no one's fault. It's just the way we coped. We coped in different ways. And, you know, it wasn't until I decided to get more involved and, you know, and that was my way of coping and helping others. But that wasn't unfortunately till after my mom passed away. So when I saw this film, I was like, why didn't I think of this? I wish I would have filmed so much of, you know, my mom. And now, like you said, if you've been through it before, what you could do moving forward. And I'm like, who can I do this with now? Yeah, yeah. You know? well, I mean, that's what I would love if this conversation generates in the people who are listening is like, you know, we're all struggling with these feelings of, of um, failure and Im impotency because we can't stop these diseases from like eating our loved ones alive. And like, that's failure, right? <laughs> like that, that feels impotent. Um, and and we also struggle with the feelings of like, it's too late. Marianne, your mom's already dead. And yet, tell me her name. Rosaria. Rosaria? Mm -hmm. And what was hilarious about Rosaria? So too many things. <laughs> um, I tell Jennifer stories all the time, but, um, and I tell people, even I, I love going back to family members, um, like my mother's siblings or um, in-laws and things and just asking questions all the time, like about my mom, of things that, you know, I might not remember completely because my mom was sick for um, more than half my life, uh, probably my whole life, honestly. What, what age did she get sick and what age did she- I'm She was diagnosed when she was about 36. But she was probably showing symptoms um, way before that. And how old were you when she was diagnosed? Uh, when she was diagnosed, I was 12. <laughs> Brutal. So, yeah, so, you know, I put on that mom hat uh, for a long time. I, my parents were also separated. So it was just me, my mom, my sister. And so for a long time. And I look back and I think of things that have happened and... 
you know, I was the mom, I played the mom role. And even when my mom was sick, she was like, I can't believe my daughter's taking care of me. Mm. She would say that a lot. Aww. And, you know, I'm like, well, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that I feel like I'm discovering through being a parent now, I have eight-year-old twins, but also that I've discovered through this process of making this is like, we think of people as monoliths, like, and if a disease arrives in our lives that changes their brain, then we sort of say like, this monolith of this person no longer exists, right? There's sort of the before disease person and the after disease person, and then there's the living person and the dead person. But in fact, as all of us know with these degenerative diseases, like when did it begin? What is a self? Like this person's totally gone and they can't remember me, but hey, wait a minute, they just said something directly to me. Like it starts to, there's a real movement in where the self is located, right? I would always say too, whenever I'm describing Huntington's disease and you know, comparing it to my mother, I'm like, was it the HD or was it that she's a Sicilian stubborn woman? You know, I'm not sure, you know, that's. And, and I think this about memory too, we have this sort of false story uh, as humans that memory is complete and memory is whole and memory is objective. When in fact, of course, memory is like completely fragmentary, uh, invented, responsive to extreme trauma, you know, and variable, you know, sort of all of the ways in which we're seeing how victims of sexual abuse, like over the course of their life, how impacted their brain and their memory is by, you know, an event, a traumatic event that alters the way they think and feel and are, right? I think we, we can all be sort of, um, like reassess the way we think about other people. But I think when you're a child, you imagine your mother is this fixed thing. And then suddenly the dementia or the Huntington's turns them into this unknown different thing. But in fact, like change is a part of how our memory works, how our self works. Um, but for me, like cinema in some ways gave me a way to know that I could keep remembering my dad because the I knew my mother's dementia had sort of erased my memory of who my mom was before she got sick. So I'm sure that sounds like that was true for you with your mom too. Like, it's like, where is the her located? That's, you know, I think for a lot of folks with HD, I know we had this sort of brief discussion is the, the constant battle also as a, as a child, as a caregiver of trying to determine what's them what's the HD, and then that as a as sort of an emotional struggle for, for family members. Because there are some behaviors that occur with Alzheimer's that occur with HD that, that are painful to witness, that can be painful to you because they are, someone says something that's really hurtful, someone does something that is really hurtful um, or dangerous or scary. Um, and trying to kind of separate, again, separate those threads of who is, who is which, what's the person What's the disease? What if it's both? Um, and, then you, and then what do you do with that information? What do you, now what? Um, you know, hearing you also, that going back to when your dad says, you know, think of me as your little brother. There are so many moments in this film as well where I think like, oh, imagine if those conversations happen, right? The number of, you know, the having the awareness, whether it's the person with HD or the caregiver to say, you know, this is, this is okay. This is how we're going to kind of work it for now. I'm going to, you're going to kind of become my little sister and I'm going to take care of you um, and be that, be your mom for you and make sure that you're going to be okay. Because so many kids take on parental roles. And we've talked about like the parentification of children in HD families, where all of a sudden this relationship has turned over on its head. And you're thinking, what, what do I do with my mom when I have to be a mom to my mom? What do I, you know, what do I do with my dad now that I'm a dad to my dad? You know, I mean, I, I, I'm just thinking like, we're, we're, there's sort of a world of possibility of ritual and creation that we could do um, outside of uh, like the desperation of disease. And like kids are forced to become their parents of their parents. 
Um, but I was just like, just hearing you talk about that, Jennifer, I suddenly like, I was like, wow, wouldn't that be kind of fun today? Like with our kids, like if I said like, you guys are the parents for a day. You guys tell us what to do when we're supposed to go to bed, tell us what we're supposed to eat, you know, and just like to be playful with these ideas of like how we change roles and positions as opposed to like, I mean, I think that's the thing that's so intense about this, Marianne, right? Like we're sort of forced into this thing we don't want to be in. Mm -hmm. And yet it it's generative. It allows us to have conversations about what matters. It enables us to cry when we were like afraid to cry. Like I, you know, you were like crying, like you had either maybe you had a contact lens or maybe you were crying. Yeah, I cry all the time. It's, yeah, yeah but, but I cry all the time too. And my dad has always said like, when the eyes are dark, when the eyes are dry, the organs cry. Like he's like, like, that's what you do. It's healthy. Like just let it come through, right? And I think that's what's so, um, that was so fun about making this film of like setting this project of like, I'm gonna try to keep my father alive forever. We're gonna like gather all these pieces of him so that we can rebuild him almost like a Frankenstein, like he's falling apart. We're gonna like find a way to laugh at this. And that sounds like totally what your family has done. Like actually we, damn it, like <laughs> we are going to laugh at this. That doesn't mean we only laugh at this, we also cry. But you just gave me the coolest idea, Jennifer. Like, I'm totally going to take that to the co-parents in my family yeah. and say, like, can we, like, let the kids parent for a day? Yeah, well, you know, thinking about it, it's it's very much like, one, it's it's practice, right? So if you're in a, in a family where you know HD exists, where you know that this could be coming for you, it's interesting practice. So it doesn't feel quite so... Um, quite so shocking or quite so quite so much of a power struggle when it happens because I think that's also a, a big part of it as well as there's this power struggle you know I'm supposed to be the parent I'm supposed to take care of you I'm supposed to be the one who is protecting you not you protecting me that's not your job um, but if you're allowed to play with it and practice it might ease some of that transition when you when it finally comes you know I'm thinking about um, you know moments <laughs> I'm sure so many parents are like, I would never, I would never, I would never. Um, but it's, it's, it is a way to be playful um, and it's a way to have fun. So, well, and I think, I mean, it's interesting, like um, we, we don't do some of these things until we have to. We don't have conversations about death. We don't make living wills. We don't allow our children to drive a car <laughs> at age eight, right? because there's real risk involved. There's real pain involved. And, you know, as a camera person over all these years, like one of the things I've learned is that when you're recording some things, right? So we're here in this present moment, you know, it's 2.26 on Wednesday. When other people watch this, it will be the future. And we don't know what's gonna happen, right? One of us may die in between now and when people watch this. This may be our last words. This concept that like recording or a camera coming into a space, it brings the future into the space and it brings death into the space. Because, you know, we're live with each other, but we won't always be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so this sort of toggling in time is what cinema can do. You know, and when we think about some of our most favorite movies, the people who are in them are already dead, but we experience them as completely alive, right? And I think this is like the sort of brutality of these diseases is that we're like living with this person who we are imagining already dead. Parts of them are already dead to us. And yet the person is there and you have to deal with this person's being cantankerous or stubborn or repeating that you're the best daughter in the world a hundred times in an hour, you know, and it's, it's hard. It's really hard to be in the like expanded presence, the expanded presence and present of it. Right. Um, but I think, you know, I think about like, how do we, how do we stay playful with it? 
and not stay fixed in our position in relation to it is part of what's helped me in the process. But, you know, yesterday I called my dad who's in a dementia care facility and he said, I'm going to start walking towards you tonight. And, you know, he's seven hours away from me and it was late at night. And I like, I just, he's never said that before. And it like kind of killed me. And it's also this just gorgeous metaphor of like, he's walking towards me. He's like willing to walk through like the sleet and the snow and the darkness of night. Like he's just going to do one step at a time to get closer to me. And that kind of gentle metaphoric way of communicating is so like, one of my big ones with my mom was I was stroking her hair and she said, oh, has Kirsten gone? And I said, no, I'm right here. And she said, oh, that's so interesting because your touch was reminding me of you. Mm. Mm. You know, and like, so like, who are we? What are we? What is consciousness? What is the self? What is it to know another person? Like we can forget each other's names, but like, no, like, oh, that's your touch. I know that. Um, and I think, you know, that's what's so powerful about in some ways, like both accepting that diminishment and death is coming, but also refusing it to say like, Rosario is alive. She's alive in you, Marianne. She's alive in your sister. And like, like how is she gonna manifest in this conversation? Like what funny thing is gonna come back to you because of something I say, right? And how does my mother come back? And so, so I think of like, if we can open ourselves up to imagining that time is not so linear, that loss is not so linear, um, but that it's all, woo, some crazy tangle. And if we can like, you know, sort of shape shift within it, but that's easier for me to say as an adult who lost my mother, you know, she started declining when I was in my early 30s. Your mother was in her early 30s and you were a child, right? Um, it's, you know, it's in some ways like it's crazy that I should be so upset that my dad's going to get dementia and die when he's 87. No. And yet, it's not like I'm like. I really don't want this man to die. He's the best. He's really the best. He's so great. Yes. He's such a dude. I really <laughs> need him in my life. Not even <laughs> You know? So something else that I, that kind of, that struck me as well, you know, thinking back on the, the idea of shared experience um, was conversations you also had with your dad about, and this will be so familiar for so many HD families, about freedom and driving and loss of independence. Not only the loss of independence in terms of him not being able to live on his own anymore and having to come with you to this new city, to this new place that's big and busy and overwhelming, um, you know, and so much smaller <laughs> than I'm sure he was used to because, you know, New York City. Yeah. But also just the loss of, of, of ability, the loss of independence, the, the sort of key to freedom, literally, and the keys to the car, which for so many HD families, that harder than losing a job, harder than a diagnosis in some ways is taking the keys away. Um, how did that kind of, and I know for your mom as well, same, similar thing. How did you guys manage that? In the film, it shows kind of the management of that discussion and his pain, but how did you have, a, have to long discussions? What did you guys end up doing there? And then how did you as a caregiver have to, how did it feel being the one being like, this is, mm. I'm, I'm doing this purposefully. Yeah. I, well, I mean, I think, you know, we learn from other humans who've been through things before us, right? And one of my dear friends, Carol Dysinger, I watched her go through her mother's dementia. And I remember her saying to me, um, you know, we either, you either do things too early or too late with this disease. And she said, I just, I'm going to invite you <laughs> to imagine if you don't take your mom's keys away, what it's going to mean for her if she gets in an accident uh, and if she hurts another person. And it was just like, oh, I don't wanna think about that. I don't wanna think about that. And yet it was like, I have the responsibility to think about that. I am now the person who has the responsibility to think about that. 
And, um, you know, you don't know these things, you don't know what's too late until it is too late. Um, and I remember this moment uh, with uh, the kids, they were twins, two years old, and we were, I, I was out with them by myself at a restaurant and we were on a patio and they just broke free from me. They were just learning to like really run and, and they were not, they were not very verbal and they just ran in opposite directions towards oncoming traffic. And it was like a total Sophie's Choice moment of just like, which one of them is running slower? And me just sprinting in one direction, grabbing one, running as fast as I could. And, you know, I caught the other one and I can't even remember which was which now because I can't bear to think of it. But like caught by the, you know, scruff of the collar, the other one from getting hit by a car. And you could say, I shouldn't have taken them to a restaurant. I shouldn't have been outside in the patio. I should have known that as one person, I couldn't take care of two kids, but I didn't know that until I knew that. And this is true for a child having their parent change in front of them. It's like, I learned, oh, I have to hold my dad's hand walking the street, he might trip. But then one day we were headed to the um, car garage to get the car and I had let go of his arm. He was just standing there. And for some reason he just jumped in back of the backing up car and almost got run over. And it was like, you know, I am responsible for this human being, but I don't have control of this thing that is, you know, the changes happening in their brain where, and, and so, so that sort of parallel of like a kid growing up, you don't know what they can do. You don't know what a declining person is going to do, but you're responsible for them. It's an incredible, pressure to handle. And then if you have them fighting back and saying like, are you crazy? I can drive. Don't take my keys away. Like it's their independence. As my father says in the film, how dare you take that away from them? Yeah. It's interesting. Um, something you just mentioned, I, and I, ex I guess it's a blessing. I never, realized my mom was changing while um, I was losing pieces of her. Mm -hmm. I always looked at her like she was just my mom mm -hmm. and lived in that present moment, even though I was, you know, forced to change, forced to be in a different role and take care of her and my sister. Um, and I put that hat on for so long, but I never realized it's because my mom couldn't do something. And mm -hmm. I never saw the disease till the day she died. And I'm lucky and I'm happy that I still do that with people I work with and my friends and my family. And I hope I never see the disease and I just see them as mm. they are at that moment. Mm. Mm. That's so interesting. I mean, I one of the things I feel like I've learned through this process is to accept more contradictions. And so like watching, I didn't, I did the same thing that you did with my mom where I didn't see the disease. I like, I was like, it was just my mom. And, and in some ways I, it made me like more angry at my mom of like, what's going on with you, right? And my father saw the disease and was able to, and I think partially because he was a psychiatrist, was able um, to, be patient with her in a way that it took me several years to be able to adjust to. Cause I would just be like, why did you do that? And he'd be like, that's not a question you ask a person with dementia, <laughs> you know, like she doesn't know. Um, and so I think like, that's what's so crazy about this film in which I, you know, kill my father over and over again. And, and all this, and I was like, you know, I had this idea and I was like, I'm going to kill my father over and over again until he really dies for real. And it's going to be a funny movie. And everyone was just like, what are you doing? And the producers I was working with were like, what are you doing? Why do you, why, why must he die? And, you know, I was one because it's like, cause it, cause I'm desperate because that's what's going to make it be funny. That's what the stakes are. Um, but, you know, Jennifer, like this thing of practicing, it's like acknowledging to myself that the, the disease does exist, that it isn't doing things to us. And like that, I, that I'm angry at him for getting sick. 
I'm so angry at him for doing this to me. I want to kill him. He's so angry that he's sick. You know, sort of sort of allowing these contradictory emotions to exist simultaneously. So the film has lots of tone shifts in it, like where you're like, it's super earnest. And then it's like, boom, just killed him, you know, and, and you don't see it coming. So that sort of that feeling of not seeing it coming was also something I was trying to replicate because that's the just the mind of this disease relationship, right? You don't see it coming. Yeah, and there's it's an it's interesting you say that as well because there, if there's speaking of contradictions, there's both the sort of in the inability to see it coming and the constant fear that it is coming, right? I'm remembering a moment in the film where you talk about how you know every call felt like an alarm bell, um, and I know for folks in the HD community that's a very familiar sentiment, whether it's because their loved one is in a nursing home and they know they're getting towards the end, or because you know that someone's not quite safe in the environment that they're in. And you think we're just on the we're just on the precipice. Something is going to happen. I know that something is going to happen. Um, so there's also this sort of a deep desire to not see it coming, to, to not acknowledge it, and not want it to be real. And then a constant anxiety because you know it is. Uh, yeah. The other thing um, that really struck me was I know we've talked a little bit about anticipatory grief was also the notion of of loss long before it happens. You know, loss not, you know, someone might, someone isn't dead, but they, there is a lot, the loss has happened already. There's so many losses that have compounded and compounded or that person that you knew before isn't there anymore. Um, which kind of goes back to the idea of memory and the power of documentation and the power of film. Because in creating that, you create a memory for yourself. You create a narrative for yourself and you create these, um, you kind of have control over how and what you want to remember by how and what you document. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting to think about like the many things that we need in this. We need emotional protection. We need emotional openness. We, you know, like it's like these really contradictory things. You know, we need to imagine how horrible it's going to get. We can't bear to imagine how horrible it's going to get. Like, you know, and and I think loss, like. I recently talked to this um, filmmaker who had made a film about children who lost their parents uh, at a very young ages. And, and she just said, oh, grieving is always, grieving goes on forever. And I was like, oh, of course it does. Like, why do we talk about things like closure and what, you know, it's just like grieving is forever. And yet what is grieving? Grieving is not only sorrow, it is, loving, it is remembering, it is re-remembering, it is, you know, like sort of like conjuring Rosaria, like it's conjuring my mom, Katie Jo. It's like, that's grieving is like um, saying like, wow, this person really mattered. And somehow they still really matter. Um, but so like, if you could say, Marianne, like you had to grieve your own childhood while it was happening. You lost your childhood while it was happening. But is there ways that you get to reclaim your childhood now? And and some of that we just do unconsciously, like I'm just having a bowl of ice cream because I want to, <laughs> you know, right? Um, but like that reclaiming of our childhood, like I felt like my father did that in making this film. There were moments when he was, he's so, he's just like, I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> Oh, I'm asking you, Marianne. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. How do you reclaim your childhood? Or does it feel all lost? Does it still feel all lost? I don't feel like I, you know, and I know I was because I did, I was forced to grow up, but I don't feel like I needed anything. Like I, mm. I feel like my childhood, what I've gone through, what I and what I still go through is made me who I am today. And I wouldn't change that for the world because some of the experiences that I had, my memories with my mom when I was younger with me, just me, my sister, and my mom would have never happened if it wasn't for um, that, if it wasn't for her having Huntington's. And so many things in my life wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for it. So I'm for such a horrible thing. And I would do anything to have my mother with me, of course. Um, I'm grateful that it's in my life and mm -hmm. um, was put into my family's life 
because I don't think we would be the same without it. Mm, mm, mm. So I don't see myself eating a bowl. I don't eat ice cream anyways, but I guess if I would maybe put some extra sprinkles on for fun. Or there you go. Now <laughs> you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> So interestingly, the, the idea of the reclamation of childhood, I think another way to put it would be letting go of being a parent. I think for, for folks in HD families, it's, it's more like letting, you can let go. You don't have to be constantly thinking of other people. You can think of yourself. You don't have to um, always be the one who's trying to keep everything together, who feels like, you know, something that's really common are like, uh, are issues with anxieties or obsessive compulsive issues because HD is a thing you have no control over, very, very little control over. So there, so you're constantly trying to find other ways to get control, um, whether it's being a caretaker and being a caregiver and taking on all of this responsibility. So sometimes it's just that notion of like, you can let go, you can mm -hmm. let go, it's okay. Um, so it's like, uh, reclaim, so reclaiming the role of child or letting go of the role of parent mm -hmm. so like marion how are you letting go of being a parent <laughs> don't ask my sister that question ah, what would she say she's she's literally a year and a half younger than me and i still talk about her treat her like she's five years old she's like she's like stop but being my mother yeah uh, sometimes please ah. <laughs> Sometimes she's like, you've enabled me my whole life. This is why I am the way I am. I'm like, you got to go to therapy. You, oh, you know? my goodness. That um, sounds like you are having the time. You are having <laughs> the time of your lives. I am I try to do a lot of self-care and for myself because I know and try to let go of being in control of certain things. But it is very difficult. Um, and... I have my, you know, inner demons that I face because of I wasn't able to control so many things that happened in my life. So I, hmm, I yeah, um, yeah, you can, right, all a lot um, within myself and around me, um, and and I try to do it in a positive way, but sometimes it's hard. Um, Mm. I, it's so interesting, Jennifer, when you said the words um, caregiver and caretaker. It's never occurred to me, like, the give and the take. Uh, and what do we call it, right? Is it a caregiver or a caretaker? It's very, that's like such an interesting, like when we're thinking about revisiting these roles or imagining how they can be different or like, attempting to let go of some of the control. I mean, I do think these things are generational. You know, my mother, um, as one sees in the film, you know, she was a young woman about to graduate from college and she was driving her mom to the college graduation and then they got hit by a drunk driver and her mother was killed. And I would say like that manifested in my mother's life by a wish to control things. And cause she, you know, made one mistake. And, you know, you know, it was a drunk driver that hit them, but I bet my mom was going through a yellow light, like just knowing my mom, like I'm sure she was going through a yellow. And uh, I was not aware of her blaming herself for that during my lifetime, but there's just no question that um, she didn't want to make mistakes anymore. She didn't want me to make mistakes. She wanted to protect me from making mistakes. And, and that sort of like controlling critical impulse stemming from that traumatic event had, of course, like this, like, you know, across the generation, like effect of me, like, I'm an incredible risk taker. <laughs> you know, like I've traveled to 86 countries in the world. Like, you know, like I, I've, I've filmed the tallest building in the world. Um, and in some ways, like I, I'm living out my mother's unconscious desire to not have to worry about making mistakes. And in some ways I've had to learn of like, you know, well, there might be consequences, like, you know, maybe like <laughs> slow down a little bit. And, and these things, I think, swing back and forth in generations, right? And so the way that your sister might parent may be that she's like super hands off because you so overparented her in your wish to compensate for your mother, right? And, 
And I think in some ways, like accepting that we're part of these streams that swing, you know, back and forth. And some of it we can work on through therapy, through self-care, through talking with, but in some ways it's like, we are who we are and we become who we are because we've lived through things. And so, you know, for me to like, I finally be able to like identify in this film and say like, oh, look at that. Look at why my mother only wanted to look at beautiful things. Why my mother only wanted to talk about positive things. You know, instead of like me being angry at her, like deal with racism, deal with the social injustice in the world, deal with poverty. She's like, I don't want to look at that. I want to go walk in the park, right? And me being angry at her for that, suddenly for me to go to the place of having compassion of like, hmm, she saw her mother dead next to her, like at age 21. You know, she's That's been through a journey. Stuff. I haven't yeah. been through, right? Yeah. And so, okay, easy for me to go to a war zone and film with people. Not for her. Mm -hmm. She's already been there, done that. <laughs> right? That's also it's such interesting. a... Oh, go ahead, Marianne, go ahead. It's interesting. Now that you're explaining, like, how your mother was and then how you sort of live completely differently, my mother was very overprotective of me mm -hmm. and my sister, even when she was in... And I think that was the biggest loss for her was not being able to take care of me and my sister mm -hmm. like even when she was in a nursing home she was every night ordering food to make sure we had food to eat even though we weren't there you know like little things like that so they'd be like your kids aren't here you have no money for pizza or Chinese food what are you doing <laughs> you know and she just kept holding on to that and she was wouldn't let us sleep over anyone's house like very overprotective and then now me and my sister we do things that sort of, you know, enjoy life. Like, let's go jump out of a plane. Like, things like that to um, not, I guess, I, I don't know, push the limits or the envelope a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's sort of like in so many ways, sometimes our parents can be our sort of an, the model of what we don't want to do. You learn, of the, you learn all these things like, okay, I don't want to do that. I don't know what I want to do yet, but I know I don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is also really interesting. But you know, Kirsten, you also mentioned that journey towards compassion, which I think as, as a caregiver or caretaker is also can be really hard. And as a child growing up in an HD family, that journey towards compassion takes time and takes per perspective. Sometimes it's just the perspective of age of thinking, oh God, okay, yeah, no, I, I understand now. I think I understand what they were going through a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. The last kind of piece I wanted to touch on was the the idea of um, of sort of plans gone awry, um, which mm -hmm. which you don't you know you don't necessarily see this in the film, but obviously your plan was that you wanted to take care of your dad and you wanted mm -hmm. to be you wanted him to be at your home and that was the journey that you were going to take with him, but it took a left it's taken a turn and I think for so many HD families that that happens to them. They think, I'm not, I'm not going to let my loved one be in a long-term care facility. I'm not going to let them be taken care of by someone else because I, I know what's best for them. I'm an amazing caretaker or a caregiver and I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Um, and then you just reach a point where you can't, you just can't anymore. What was that kind of moment like for you with your, with your dad mm -hmm. or even mm -hmm. with your mom as well? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, isn't it interesting, um, like where this sort of edge between care and martyrdom, like, like it's like, woo, that's a, that's a funny edge, <laughs> right? Um, and, and then resentment that builds up, you know, like in so many ways, like I'm such a good daughter and my, you know, and my father just like tells me over, like, you're the best daughter in the world. And then meanwhile, like, you know, my brother has this high powered job is not being a caregiver, you know came to visit my dad a couple of times in the three and a half years that he was living with me. And, and I was like filled with resentment. Like I'm the dutiful daughter. Right. And like, Oh, the man doesn't have time to do this. You know, like, and I think there is a lot of, um, you know, sort of 
years of sexism and misogyny built into like who gets paid to do the work, how much they get paid, uh, who's expected to do the work in a set of siblings, who's expected to do the cooking, you know, even now I'll be like, I have to cook, you know, and I love cooking, but it's like, sometimes I'm just like, don't expect me to be the one doing the cooking. Right. So we're sort of fighting all these, um, fighting all these things all of these uh, contradictions around roles. And I just really like, I just, my dad is like the best dad ever. It was like, just always so easy with him. He's just like, so funny, so easy my entire life. And so I was just like, I'm not like, I'm not letting him down. I'm like, I'm staying with him all the way. And I had this like thing in my mind around the film. It's like, we're just gonna like walk to the edge of the cliff together. And when he falls off, like I'll be right there at the edge of the cliff, right? And this was sort of a metaphor I used to myself. Well, when the pandemic came, I was traveling uh, and we were gonna have to go through a quarantine when we got back. And so my brother took my dad and it was just this incredible gift because the impossible became possible. My brother couldn't go to his job. He just had to stay home with my dad every day. And within a month, he was saying to me like, oh my God, I can't believe what you've done. You're so epic. This is so hard. I'm so glad I'm with dad. I can't believe I get to have this time with him. He was speaking all of the contradictions, painful contradictions I've been living with. Like the things that you're saying, Marianne, it's like, you're saying like, I'm grateful my mom died at 36, right? Which you are. And also like, no, you're not. No, you're not, right? And finally, my brother, instead of just like putting a positive spin on it, it's like, it's great. The dad's there with your kids. And, and it's like, he was just like, oh, this is so hard. And little by little, I mean, it took months and months. I just started to like the resentment that was growing in me towards my brother just started to lift, which is so beautiful. <laughs> but then at a certain point, my brother, who is, you know, slightly more pragmatic than me and his wife, who's definitely more than pragmatic than me, they said, like, we can't keep doing this. And I had to say to myself, can I take him back? And it was like, I can't. I can't raise my own children. I can't work because my dad needs me all the time. And we can't know when he's gonna need me. His present has expanded so much. So like sort of against my will, <laughs> I agreed, we're gonna move him into a dementia care facility. Well, you know, I had imagined I'm like walking to the edge of cliff with him and then he's gonna fall off and I'll be at the top of the cliff. Putting him into the dementia care facility was like, we walked to the edge of the cliff, he fell off, he grabbed a branch, he's five feet down and he's like, please, please lift me up. And I'm standing at the top of the cliff going like, no, sorry, I can't. And suddenly, even though I've spent three and a half years making this film, it's on Netflix, everybody loves my dad, it's awesome, we're getting awesome reviews. I'm like filled with guilt, filled with guilt. Mm -hmm. Can't I do more? Shouldn't I do more? And it's hard for me to call him every day because I don't know if he's going to say like, hey, how you doing? Or he's going to say, I'm, I'm going to start out walking towards you. How can I leave him there by himself? And yet I must. It's brutal. Right, Marianne? It's brutal. <laughs> I was going to ask you, so because I guess I was so young, I didn't have those, you know, pre-conversations, you know, what was going to happen. <laughs> You know, I, I didn't know it. The moment my mom was diagnosed, I knew she was going to die. I, I was twelve. How was I going to take care of her? I, but I thought I could. I was, you know, I thought I would just take care of her forever. And I had these like visions in my head of, you know, all right, I'll go to school and I'll wheel her. You know, like crazy yeah. weird yeah. things. You yeah. know, don't yeah. come with me, right? Yeah. Um, or, but I knew like, and just like I anticipated her passing and when it did happen, I was in a state of shock. Like how, I didn't think that day was ever gonna come. And I totally get that cliff thing because my mother, she would, she, she was a, she was an, she was a character, but <laughs> she would, you know, call, she would order Chinese, she would order pizza, order these things, you know, to take care of me and my sister when she was, when we placed her and she would, you know, make sure she got kicked out and they had to send her to the ER 
once a week because she knew I would show up. And I would, I would go like once, twice a week. I was more of that um, person that needed to see her more in order to cope. And I had a lot of resentment towards my sister during it. I was like, come with me. And she's like, I just can't see mom like this right now. And I said, why? And like, I need to be there all the time. And, but as I, as I grew up and looking back on it, I realized that's just how she was coping and there was nothing wrong with it. And, you know, I have no resentment at all. And I'm glad that I let it go a long time ago. But during it, it was so hard for me to understand, like, what do you mean? Like, how do you not take care, you know, or do certain things like I'm doing? Not everybody is going to, you know, take, like, deal with things the way I am, right? We're all different people. And it took a long time for that. But so I, and I started holding on to the cliff, like, help me, help me. Oh, 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 yeah. I mean, and, and and it's just like, I thought I was like pre-visualizing and imagining the cliff. I just never imagined like the branch five feet down and him like hanging on by an arm. I was like, oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> so I'm readapting. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think for me, and that was what like the quest in this film is like to allow contradictory emotions to exist simultaneously, you know, and and to try to find ways to voice them that are not blaming each other like, I know part of why it was so hard for my brother to visit my dad during that time was it was like ripping his heart out. And he couldn't like rip it out one day and go back to work the next day. Like, you know, and. Um, Did you ever have that conversation with your dad about placement at all? You know, it's so interesting. We, we didn't like, because we, and I like the way you're saying placement, because I mean, I think that like language is so important, like we put them in a home, like that's like not helpful language, right? <laughs> placement is odd also, like it's sort of like an object being put on a shelf, like, you know, so so what is the language? But um, what was amazing was, um, you know, there's the scene in the film where dad is out trick or treating on Halloween with me and my kids. And then we le- we drop him off at a friend's apartment. And when we came back, my dad was just completely freaked out and like didn't know where he was. And I realized like he he just sort of experienced Halloween as this nightmare landscape. So then we created a fiction scene uh, of what happened to him in that apartment while we were out trick or treating and had left them there. And, and, and the idea was like, it's sort of hell for him. He doesn't know where he is. He can't get out. There's doors everywhere. And we'd had this idea that we were going to, you know, have one, him open one door and then it would be a, a, a home. It would be a dementia care facility. And, but that wasn't on the set. It was just a green screen. So there was nothing there when he opened the door. But he's sitting there with me, we're in costume, we're sitting there and, and he doesn't know really what's going on. And he doesn't know what we're going to put behind that door in the future movie. And he says, wow, I'm just sitting here thinking about us making the decision about whether to put mom in the home or not. This reminds me of that. And I was just like, oh my God. I was like, how do you know that? How do you know that that is the fear that I'm expressing by building this set with all of these doors? And I could barely speak. I was just like, so we did talk about it, Marianne. We talked about it in that moment because he got it. You know, and that's the thing that's like so insane about like your mother was taking care of you even as she was dying. And like my father, there's this moment where he, um, woke up in the middle of the night and you know i was in the next room and he comes into the room and he's you know there's a patient downstairs and i'm like no there's not dad like it's three in the morning there's no one there and and we're back and forth about it and um i said you gotta go to bed and he's like no there's someone who desperately needs me downstairs and i'm like okay so i get up get dressed we go downstairs elevator doors open and my dad looks out and he looks at me and he said there's no one here is there and i was like nope And then he said, it must be so hard for you to watch your dad falling apart. And I was just like, oh, yeah, like this is hard. And and then he said, it just must be awful. He said, and then he goes, well, guess it's time to call the guys with the little straight jackets to come and pick me up. And and, and he starts giggling and then he goes, but you know what? You're really gonna miss me. (laughs) So, So, you know, it's like all things. 
it's manipulative, it's compassionate, it's empathetic, it's confused, it's absurd, it's so painful, it's the lack of sleep that was giving me heart palpitations, like, I'm gonna die. That That's the self-care thing, right? Like, if he's waking up seven times a night, what's happening to me? I can't do that. But, woo, it's a ride. It's a ride, baby. And it's not over, right, Marianne? It's not over. <laughs> And, you know, I, just sort of a last, a last idea of that, you know, I know we've, we've also talked about the issue of reality and when you're caregiving for someone who's got a neurodegenerative disease, whether it's Alzheimer's or a dementia or HD, as the person who's sort of cemented in this here and now, trying to figure out where, where you then go, am I going to, what's going to be better for my loved one, go to their reality for a moment? to try and bring them into my reality, to kind of split the difference and see how it goes. Um, and sort of the pain of having to constantly wrestle with that because mm -hmm. on the, you're right, it, it can feel manipulative when, you know, in that moment you might've said, yeah, you know, dad, I, they, I think they canceled. I think they canceled their appointment, but <laughs> let's, go, let's go check. I wasn't yeah. awake enough to do that. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, they rescheduled for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, have been like, okay, let's go check, let's go check it out. Let's see who's in the lobby. And, you know, the answer is nobody. And then in that moment, it's sort of like, okay, how do you then bring them back? Do you bring them back to your reality? See if they come there on their own? Or do you kind of keep playing this so that they feel comfort so that they can feel more calm? Because a lot of times in those moments, it's agitation comes from not being able to stand fully in their reality and not being able to stand in your reality either it's sort of like this constant like back and forth and it's it causes agitation mm. i know there's someone here waiting for me it feels wrong but i know there is i know it um and i'm sure marianne you relate caregiving for someone with hd same kind of thing um and kind of having to wrestle with that it's, it's so tough well, I think one thing that maybe is useful is to say, we each have needs. My father had a need in that moment to still be a psychiatrist, to still be able to take care of someone, um, to still be professional, um, to know what he was doing. I had a need to keep sleeping, <laughs> right? Um, but when I saw that he wasn't gonna go easily and give up easily, okay, I'm already awake, let's go, let's go see. And in that moment of realizing there was no one there waiting, my father realized he could still take care of me. And he said, oh, it must be hard to be a person watching your father lose his mind. And that need of his was met, right? And my need was met in a certain way. It was like I got a lucid waking dream, right, of realizing all these things that my father is. And so I think that's the juggle. And I know like with my brother and I, when we go to visit my dad now, he really wants to come home with us. And so we can go and visit for the allotted half an hour and he'll just say, please take me home. Please take me home. I'll do anything. I'll wash the dishes. Please take me home, right, for a half an hour straight. And it's unbearable. Whereas when we call him, he'd be like, hey, how's it going? You know, like having a great time here watching TV. Like, and so we wonder, like, should we go visit him? We need to go. He needs us to come. There's a pandemic. We need to not get him sick, right? But so, you know, I went several times in a row because it's he's down in Bethesda. I, I visited several days in a row. And I, I, I kept sort of telling him the lie, we're gonna get you when the pandemic's done, dad, don't worry, we're gonna get you soon, it's gonna be done soon. And then I came home and I was like, I hate not telling him what the deal is. And so I said to my brother, like, come with me. This is, I'm having too hard a time doing this on my own, come with me. And what are we gonna say to dad um, when he says, take me home? And I said, maybe we should just like tell him we can't. And what was so beautiful was my brother described my life to my dad and said why I couldn't. And I described to my dad why my brother couldn't. And it was so great to hear from the other person why we can't. Because when you have to say it about yourself, you just feel like you're failing. 
but so like I think that like we're in it together with more people than we think it are we we are. And like, and we don't want to not tell my dad the truth all the time, but we can't tell him the truth all the time because it's too heartbreaking. None of us can stand it all the time. So we're trying to meet his needs, trying to meet our needs, but sometimes other people help us, right? Like talking to you both, like is helping me, honestly. In this <laughs> and it's hard sometimes. And I, we, me and Jennifer have spoken about this. You know, I, if you ever need an actress, I'm the greatest actress. Um, but, you know, caring for somebody with Huntington's disease and being around a lot of people working with them, I have learned to put on different hats and get into their reality, right? Get into mm -hmm. mom's reality. But sometimes it, it's easier said than done when someone you love. Like, I just wanted my mom to understand what I was going through or I needed her to answer a certain question and she couldn't. And I would get so frustrated. I would get angry. And sometimes somebody on the outside would be like, relax, like she doesn't understand. And be like, no, but she's my mom. She has to understand. Yeah. And sometimes you fight with that. Um, but, you know, until you go through it, you don't know, you know? And Yeah. Yeah. And I think we all think we are more alone in these things than we are. I think many of us are sharing this across multiple diseases. And I think many of us are sharing this in the pandemic. Um, and I think admitting how hard it is, is useful. And then also like, let's be inventive. I'm, I'm actually gonna go out of here, out of this conversation and be like, can we do that? Can we like let the kids be parents for a day? Like, we're gonna try it. <laughs> and then like asking your father, telling your father, you know, you and your brother Joe having that conversation, you don't realize, you know, sometimes the truth, you know, will set you free and that acceptance is there within your loved one as well. Mm -hmm. You just don't even realize that they sort of have to just get there on their own, what, in however way that may be. Mm. And look. Mm. Thank you for saying that, Marianne. Yeah, I got work to do on that front. <laughs> I'm in it. I'm in the thick of it. <laughs> well, Kristen, I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having this conversation with us. Thank you for let it, get it, letting us get to know your dad, who is... I know you've heard this probably a bazillion times. Such a joy. What a joyous man. Yes, yes. Yes, Dick Dawson. Um, you know, for folks at home. I might need one of those. Not I know. know. I was thinking that too. Needs one. Everyone needs one. <laughs> I know. Like, look at it as like a little daily affirmation. I think you should make um, a Rosaria one. Make a Rosaria one. Yeah, Marianne, go on. <laughs> but the, and I, I want to see it. I know. And hopefully for people are also going to take from this different ideas of how they can kind of confront some of the realities that they're facing, how they can be kinder to themselves, how they can be more, um, more playful sometimes with the hard choices that are ahead, the hard discussions that they have to, they have to have in their life, especially when it comes to caring for someone with a neurodegenerative disease um, and to treasure the moments that they have, to not let those slip away because it's not too late. Um, it's not too early and it's not too late. It's just the right time to, to capture your loved ones and to keep them, to keep their thoughts and their experiences with you because you don't know when you're gonna need it. Um, so yes, thank you for joining us. Everyone could watch this beautiful film on Netflix. Um, if you don't have a Netflix account, Ask a friend, someone does. <laughs> I love it. Someone does. Um, and thank you again. And thank you, Marianne, for also joining us and talking about your experience. Thank you so much. It was so nice meeting you. And I just it was so nice to meet you and Rosario and say hi to your sister and like right on. I love that you came on the screen shaking your head and smiling. That's what this movie is. It's shaking your head and smiling, laughing and crying simultaneously. Jennifer, you've been an amazing host. This has just been a total joy. And thanks also to Chris Constantino for making this happen. And, you know, I, I'm honored to be in your company and have great respect for the pain you all live with um, and also great hope for the ways that you transform it and translate it to the rest of us. You know, we call HD the quintessential family disease. So you're, you're part of the family now. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> you're like one of us. Um, thank you guys. And, uh, and that's the deal with Dick Johnson is dead. <laughs> <laughs>